and um, I'm going to introduce uh, our speaker for the first WIND seminar this term. So I'm very excited that today we have Heather Zinn Brooks, who is an assistant professor of mathematics uh, at Harvey Mudd, and she specializes in mathematical modeling of complex systems. Uh, she's got her bachelor's degree uh, from the University of Utah, and uh, she was a CAM postdoctoral um, a fellow, I guess, uh, at the mathematics department at UCLA, which is where I have had the pleasure to spend some time with her together. So I'm very excited for Heather's talk today. Uh, please take it away, Heather. Thank you so much, Alice. I'm so delighted to be here. This is an amazing group and the lineup looks phenomenal. So super stoked to see all the talks after mine. Um, I saw, so if you came here after seeing Alice's tweet about my talk, uh, she, she gave this very nice advertising tweet, um, but she did say that I was gonna talk about uh, why things show up in your social media feed. And I just wanna say up front that I'm not gonna do that. So if you thought I was gonna talk about this and you were lured under false pretenses, I'm sorry, but also, you know, sorry, not sorry. You're here now, you may as well stay. Uh, I'm actually gonna talk about a little bit more. <laughs> no worries, I, I think it's great. I just didn't want people to think that I was gonna talk about like algorithms for selection and social media platforms because that stuff's super cool, but I'm not gonna talk about it. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about theory um, and particularly models for opinion dynamics, which do have a lot of relevance clearly for, for online social networks. So that's the, that's the little caveat sales pitch at the beginning. Um, the second caveat that I wanna give just because of how I'm presenting my slides, those of you who heard, I'm doing a little bit of an experimental thing. So please have some patience for me if, uh, if I have to deal with a little bit of technical stuff. I'm gonna try to do some notations on my iPad. We'll see how it goes. And also because of that, you can see some things around my slides um apologies just ignore them uh the one thing that you can see that looks horrifying is it says that i have 67 slides i just want to say up front i do not actually have 67 slides to present i'm one of those people that has like a slide graveyard at the end of all of my talks so there's a whole bunch of slides at the end like after the end of the talk that's why so don't be like oh my god there's 67 slides no like i don't have 67 slides Okay, so I now with with my oh look I'm already do this is already exciting. Okay, um, so what I want to do is not to do drawing. I want to I'm going to go ahead and like just move this way. Uh, I like to start talks other than starting with a million caveats. I wanted to start by talking about the context of my work and my journey in mathematics and what I'm interested in, because I think that really helps to contextualize why I like these problems and why I'm interested in these problems. So I am an assistant professor in the math department at Harvey Mudd, as, as Alice kindly introduced me. And I call my research group the Nonlinear and Complex Systems Research Group. And basically the idea, everything that motivates my research program is about making connections in complex systems that involve dynamics and structure and the interplay of those two things. And as a result, that's sort of, that's really like a big picture mathematical idea. And so as a result, the projects that I work on end up being sort of all over the place. And so this is my attempt to categorize some of my interests. So uh, for, of course, the purposes of today, we're gonna to be focusing a lot in this, this networks bubble of the Venn diagram. I've been doing a lot of work with um, dynamical systems on networks. Um, and the applications that I work on mostly fall into either biological systems or human social systems. And some of those things involve networks and some of them, uh, I work in more classical dynamical systems, differential equations sort of thing. So, um, and I, you can see all these like mysterious pictures that uh, represent different things that I do. And if you're, if you're interested ever in something else that I don't talk about today, you know, this is a this is a invitation for you to go to my website, look at the other kinds of projects I have. Feel free to reach out anytime. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to give you the context, and then today we'll be we'll be living in the networks and a little bit human social systems bubbles. And 
Specifically, I am here today to talk about bounded confidence models. And the first thing that I want to tell you is why I love these models and why I have dedicated an entire talk and like several research projects in my research program to bounded confidence models. Um, so this is really the purpose of this talk is just for me to give you a sales pitch on these models to why I think they're cool and interesting to study. Um, so I have four reasons here. I think now that you understand maybe some of my interest in research program, you could also see why some of these things would be appealing to me. So these models are, they're super simple models, um, as we'll see in a minute, but they actually have amazing, complicated, intricate dynamics. Um, and so there's like a really rich, from a dynamical systems perspective, they're, they're super rich models. Uh, they, of course, we could study them on networks. We can think about structures that are induced by these types of models. So it's like totally in the wheelhouse of, of dynamics and structure in this really like rich and interesting way. Um, it's very interdisciplinary. So it's interdisciplinary in the sense that there's a lot of applications outside of mathematics, but also like if you're a person within mathematics, there's a lot of crossover between the different subfields. So you can use theory from probability and stochastic processes and networks and dynamical systems and differential equations and theory about matrices and linear algebra, and just like all of these different things that they collide and, and can become useful when studying these models. Um, and of course, it's like fairly young. So there's lots of open questions, which I think is always, always fun. Okay, so that's the that's the sales pitch why I love them. Um, so now I guess I better tell you what they are. So what are bounded confidence models? Um, the idea with bounded confidence models is that we want to imagine that we have some interacting agents, which here I've represented with these little black circles. And these models come out of the opinion dynamics literature, which means that the thing that we're modeling is the way that an agent's opinion or ideology or whatever the thing is you're modeling changes in time. Um, something that's different about these models as compared to some other very popular types of models like easing models or voter models is that these opinions are taken to be continuously valued. So for example, you might take uh, opinions from the continuum like the interval zero one, for example. So you allow continuously varying opinions. Um, and this is a hallmark of, you can see down um, with these this schematic that I have that each of my three agents has has some real value opinion state. And the next thing that we need is some way that these opinions will vary in time. We need some sort of update rule. So I've represented that here with a little f of x1, x2. So each of the agents will interact with each other through an updating rule, which I'll show you a couple variants of these updating rules in a minute. Um, and this is not just true for bounded confidence models, but of all types of opinion dynamics models, right? You need a way to, to dynamically update the rules. And finally, here's the key ingredient that's, that really makes something a bounded confidence model. The idea is that you don't suppose that all agents can affect the opinions of other agents equally. Um, the idea is that, in fact, you would want to have some kind of cutoff for opinions that are too far away from each other. So I've represented this here with a red X. Um, in my schematic, we could suppose maybe that the, the confidence bound, or we had some parameter, maybe we set it to be 0.2. And we say two agents don't interact if their opinions are more than 0.2 apart. So the two agents on the top row of my schematic would not interact um, in, that, in that situation. And this is where the name bounded confidence comes from, is, is from this, this hard cutoff in, in interactions. In terms of the applications or in terms of opinion dynamics, what this represents is the notion that individuals prefer to have homophilous opinion interactions uh, in the sense that they, they don't tend to have their mind changed by people whose opinions are very far away from theirs. People are quite resistant to that. Um, conversely, they tend to be very receptive to opinions that are, that are close to their own. And so that's the, the piece that's trying to be captured here. Okay, so that's the, 
I think those three properties are, are true for all bounded confidence models. That's sort of general principles that they all have. And so now I want to make things a little more concrete, give you some equations to show you some particular types. Oh, actually, first, I want to talk about um, what types of things that people study with these types of models before I get into the, the nitty gritty. Um, so if we, as before, uh, I notated opinion with xi. So if we have some, some time varying variable for each agent that we call the opinion, um, there are two big ideas that people frequently study with these models. And they're very easy to confuse. So I wanted to upfront make sure to give you a sense of what these two things are. So the first is that we might like to know, are these opinions of these agents going to converge? And by that, I mean, as T goes to infinity, does every agent reach some fixed opinion state that is stationary? And you can see actually, in fact, that the more technical definitions are in on the slide there. And then on the right, you see what a, um, a little schematic of that, of that example. So that's one question we could ask, right? Do, do the opinions reach stationary state or are they always just like moving around and changing forever? Um, and then as a sort of an addendum to that, we might ask, well, if it does converge, does it converge in finite time? If perhaps we have a discrete time stepping, does it take a discrete number of time steps or is there an upper bound on the, on the time for which we would expect this to, to occur? Um, and then we could go even further. So if we do converge, uh, a question that's of big interest if you're studying opinion dynamics or you're interested in the applications is when do all the agents agree, right? But in what cases do they converge to the same value? And that is the a principle that we call consensus. So it is it's confusing because they both start with CON, right? But hopefully I'm I'm uh, differentiating these two things enough for you. So when we are talking about consensus in one of these models, we mean that the opinions converge and that they all converge to the same value so that everyone agrees. And as you can imagine, this is something that's a little bit maybe more difficult to achieve, uh, but definitely of interest in terms of the applications. Okay, so now as promised, we get to do the uh, particular models. So. These models are themselves born out of other models in opinion dynamics and, and they're variants of other models that I won't talk about today, but uh, these are the, are the big two. And the first is uh, what's known as the hegselman krauss model. And what characterizes this model is that it has a synchronous updating. And so by that, I mean, every agent updates their opinion by in some sense, surveying the agent, all the agents around it at every single time step. And here's how this updating happens. So now we're seeing a real an updating rule in action. Okay, and this looks quite complicated, especially because I didn't put what eta was on the slide, but that's okay because this is why I can make some notations. So this part here, let's see how this goes. This eta, is going to be our confidence bound cutoff. Okay, so what we want that to be is we want to say that, oh geez, okay, let's see, that was not so good. Eta xi xj is going to be one if we're within the confidence bound. So if, say, the distance between the two in whatever is your, fa your favorite distance metric is, is less than your confidence parameter and zero otherwise. Okay, so that eta builds in the cutoff and what we do if, uh, if our, our neighbors, or our friends are inside the cutoff is that we just average all of the opinions we see, including typically our own. Um, and so what is this weird denominator here? <laughs> this is like summing over all the eta. This is just a weird way to write like, this is the number of agents you're receptive to, including yourself. So that's um, the part that I will do here in green. This is just an averaging. Okay, so we, it's, it's quite like, maybe it looks a little notationally clunky, but you can describe it so simply, right? It's, it's almost in some sense, like the simplest way you might imagine people trying to agree on a topic. 
is that maybe you just you just talk and then you you somehow come to the average of all your opinions eventually, um, as long as you're sufficiently close. And so that's that's the idea with Hexelman Krauss. And this is all happening synchronously, simultaneously. So all of the agents are updating their state. They're doing this averaging every single time step. There's loads of theoretical results on the Hexelman Krauss model. Um, I just very briefly uh, point out the convergence and consensus here. Um, this model converges and furthermore, it converges in finite time. There's results in uh, no more than like polynomial time. So uh, there's, there's a lot of convergence results on these models. Um, and then consensus is, there's also a lot, of, a lot of theoretical results on consensus. It's a little bit trickier to write down concisely in a slide. But the idea is that it depends on a few things, right? It depends on how many agents you have. It depends on what their initial, um, what their initial data is. It depends on the confidence parameter that you choose. Obvious, I shouldn't say obviously, I hope it's clear that like if you chose, for example, C equals zero, well then of course consensus is not possible, right? Every agent just ignores everybody else and then the stationary state is just the initial state. So that's one example where you would, you would not have consensus. Um, the way most of these consensus proofs go is something like, if you imagine your opinions are on the real line and you'll notice that there's no, there's no graph structure in here yet. This is just everybody could potentially talk to everyone else as long as they're receptive. What you can actually do is order. You could just imagine, imagine ordering, call them X1, X2, X3, uh, based on their opinions. And then you can characterize whether or not this converges based on looking at right, sort of the distances between the intervals around them. In particular, right, you need to look at a chain. Sometimes in, in some literature, this is called like an epsilon chain or maybe a delta chain or something like this. Um, so you want to look for sort of an overlapping chain of, of confidence intervals, and all of those will, will converge together. So that's the, the way that you would show results here. So lots of, lots of cool theory on these Hexelman cross models. So I think as soon as you see synchronous updating, you may ask yourself, well, okay, that seems kind of unrealistic. Maybe like you don't literally talk to everyone and make a change at every time step. Like maybe a better thing to do would be to think about, you know, what, what would an asynchronous updating look like? Um, and the asynchronous version of bounded confidence is called the Defont model or the Defont Weisbuck model. And there, so there are actually other authors on this paper. I don't know why only Defont and Weisbuck's name is on this, but neither here nor there. Anyway, the idea is in this case, you select either two agents or one edge, either way, uniformly at random or at random according to some probability distribution, and you just update those two in that time step. And the updating here, I've written the equations for what that looks like. Here, I'm using the same eta, that just uh, zero one indicator function eta. Um, so again, you average the two if they're within a distance C of each other and otherwise nothing happens. Um, there's an additional parameter here, which is little m. And that's called usually the convergence or cautiousness parameter. Um, that determines how much the two agents how much or how quickly the two agents move toward each other. Um, so you can see that sort of like acts like a, like a time scale parameter in this model. Um, there's fewer theoretical results in the Defont style models, not as many as in Hicksman Krauss, um, but they're, they're definitely, they're definitely still, still a good handful of them. Uh, one thing that we know is this model converges almost surely. And by that, I mean, it, converges um, with probability one as t goes to infinity. Um, but it is not guaranteed to converge in finite time. And you could convince yourself of that by thinking, well, maybe we just accidentally, we have a really crazy outlier case where we choose the same agents um, over and over and over, right? We, we, could, we could get into a loop where we, we choose the same set of agents over and over again, and then we would not um, 
we may have a problem with converging in, in finite time in that case. Um, again, consensus is possible. Um, and again, as in the, the Hexelman Krauss, it depends on confidence parameters and initial data and number of agents. And um, there, are, there are some results on cutoffs in confidence bounds and things like that for, for Deflon Weisbuck as well. Okay, so that's the, the two big models, but um, you may be saying like, okay, Heather, this is very cool. Like, thank you, love it. Um, this is a network seminar <laughs> where you haven't said anything about networks yet. And so I better, I better rectify that situation. Those of you who maybe have seen these models before, or if you're really thinking about it, you might actually see that they're already, even in these versions I've, that I've um, suggested, you could think about them as being on a network, but we could really make that explicit. So I'm gonna do that now and talk about what happens when we put bounded confidence models on networks, which I think is where, this is where the fun really happens. This is where things really get interesting. So I've re, um, sort of rewritten Defont Weisbuck and Hexelman Krauss on the left side, but these are the versions where you would do include a network structure. So Defont Weisbuck looks the same because um, all you do is select an edge. And if the edge isn't there, well, okay, you don't, you don't select that edge. Um, and in Hexelman Krauss, you can see we've, we've included for the network version, right? We need to include our, our adjacency matrix that describes connectivity. And as I think you could convince yourself, the dynamics of these models, which are already sort of interesting and complicated, become so much more complicated when you have to consider also a network topology. Um, oh, I see there's a, there's a chat thing. Let's see, there's a, there's a question in the chat that says, if we have someone whose opinion is close to us, um, but then we changed our opinions to be closer and we weren't happy, like, could you, could you imagine a version of one of these models where maybe you move away? Um, I think that's, that's awesome. I think it would be super interesting to study a model like that. Um, that's okay, Mina, thank you. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't, know if anyone has studied exactly a model that takes into account that particular dynamics. Certainly the ones I'm talking about do not, right? You only move closer. You only move more so in agreement in these simplest models. But yeah, that's a really interesting. Um, that could be a really interesting generalization or, or extension. Yeah, thanks for, please feel free to like, yeah, throw questions in the chat anytime. I'm, I'm very happy to, um, to, answer them anytime and I will also try to stop a few times throughout to answer them. Okay, so you could see like I have an example of even this little network, right? Well, what if we end up in the situation where we have more than one connected component? Well, you can already see that this is like consensus is almost surely a no-go because even if nodes agree, right, they may not ever hear the other opinions. They may not be able to um, ever actually interact because we've restricted the interactions um, based on based on the network, as well as based on the opinion states. And so um, things get really exciting and interesting when you start to try to characterize these processes on networks. And um, that's sort of the space that I've been spending a lot of time living in and the space that I think probably this audience would be um, especially excited about. Okay, so actually this is a great follow-up to Mina's question. Um, there's like a zillion applications and generalizations of these models out there in the literature. Uh, I've listed just a few, but if you're in this field and your favorite isn't on here, apologies. Um, this is by no means a complete list. Just to give you an idea of some types of things that, that people have done, right? You could think about heterogeneities and the network parameters. You could think about including agents that are, that are stubborn, less likely to change, or maybe that don't change at all. You could think about network rewiring. You could think about adding in noise. You could think about modifying that eta function, right? Maybe, maybe not just using a simple distance cutoff, but some other kind of cutoff. Um, I, you could think about how filtering or how the choices of like which edges you select can change your change your model. So look there, I did. I talked about feeds. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. 
And uh, there's mean field versions of this model, which I've worked on some mean field stuff a little bit that I'm not gonna talk about today, but I think that's also super interesting. Instead of giving a bunch of, I could like just do the whole rest of the talk on just other people's work on founded confidence models, still not um, get within the hour. Instead, I'm just gonna leave um, at the end, I have a reference this slide and I'll leave you with some, some uh, review articles if you wanna dig into what some more of these, these generalizations are. Okay, so maybe I'll take a pause for questions um, about the setup and the bounded confidence models in general. If nobody else has one, um, I'm going to, to start one. Maybe, maybe other people come up with some too. Um, so it, it's kind of cool that um, the models, at least if you give them long time, infinitely long time, they all tend to converge. They all converge, right? Uh, and I was wondering about that. So like one thing is, it's not clear to me why you can't have something like a limit cycle popping up where I convince you, but at the same time, you've been also very convincing and suddenly we have exchanged our opinions but not converged to the same point. So what keeps these models from doing something like that? So mathematically, what keeps them from doing something like that is the fact that they're averaging. And so this is something that's always, that's always um, sort of compacting, right? Mm -hmm. But you make like an awesome point in terms of modeling these systems, maybe averaging is not always the right thing to do, right? Like certainly um, you could imagine having maybe some sort of more like nonlinear interaction there and that would that would change that. But yeah, it's just, it's because the averaging. That's a really good question, Dallas. There's, uh, there's more popping up in the chat. So I'll shut oh, up. Yes. <laughs> um, what about, oh yeah. So there could be weird things with, M. yeah, typically M is restricted so that, um, that they don't they don't cross over each other but you totally could right so you could have weird things if you made the that convergence parameter really big in the decimal model right so you could actually say like if you change more than if your change is more than the confidence bound then you can be like oh this person is so convincing they've convinced me beyond their opinion so you could totally do that that's an awesome point uh nicholas thank you um, and then general and, and Ryan asked about generalizations for like holding multiple opinions and uh, totally so in the talk I just for concreteness and simplicity I kept everything um, just on the real line, but these, uh, these results actually, at least like the main results and a, a lot of the well known things they all generalized to, or are already generalized to like opinions in RN. So you could think about that as like, um, maybe each each sort of element in your vector of opinions represents your opinion on one particular topic or something like that. Um, so, or if you wanted to decompose into maybe like social conservatism versus fiscal conservatism, maybe that's actually an opinion in R2 or something like that. So yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I, I'm sweeping that under the rug, but these are, these are definitely things that people are interested in. Yeah, great questions. Ooh. Joel's asking if RN and asymmetric. I don't know. There's definitely, so there's definitely work with asymmetric distances, right? Heterogeneity in the, in the C. I would guess so, but I actually, I'm not sure. So I'd have to check. That's a great question. Don't have the answer for that one. Amazing. Other questions? This is so great. Maybe it, like, on, <laughs> I, you know, even I don't talk about any of my work, but we but we chat about founder confidence models. You know, I'm I'm already happy. So, um, if you do, I'll I'll continue on. And if we do have other questions, throw them in the chat anytime. You don't have to wait for my question slides. Um, don't be shy. But I guess I better talk about some of my own work, um, which is I'm going to talk about a few of the things that I've been thinking about recently with my collaborators in bounded confidence models. And so I have set myself quite an ambitious talk today. We'll see how much I make it through. And I may actually end up just skipping over some things. So apologies in advance if I do that. I My intent is not to really dig into the details of any of these things, but just to sort of give you a sampling platter and then 
um, you can, you're welcome to read more, reach out to me later if anything strikes your interest. Um, so three things uh, that I have put into the slides today. The first is a work that I did with Mason Porter uh, during my postdoc, which is the most applied of these three, um, where we looked at applying a synchronous updating, so Hegselman Krauss style bound and confidence model to study media impact and how um, individuals or accounts in a social network could become entrained to media and when that would happen. So I'll talk about that first. And then projects two and three are ongoing projects. So these are, these are things like in progress. Um, the second is thinking about studying cascades with bounded confidence mechanisms. And the third is on hypergraphs. And I will definitely try to really get to the hypergraph stuff today because I know uh, I saw we have some other hypergraph stuff coming up on the schedule in this seminar. So I, uh, I think there should at least be some interest with that. So that's pretty cool. Um, and upfront before, I think it's important right away to acknowledge this, I never work alone. I'm always working in collaboration. I have like a slew of amazing collaborators on Bound to Confidence stuff. Um, not all of these projects that I'm working on with these people have made it into this talk today, but these people are all working on Bounded Confidence related things with me. Um, the little stars represent my awesome graduate and undergraduate student collaborators. So you can see a lot of this work um, is being moved forward by undergraduate and graduate students. So if you're in that place, um, lots of lots of great work to be done at all levels, I think. Um, so yes, thanks to collaborators. They're amazing. Um, get yourself some good collaborators. That's my advice, free advice for today. Okay, so let's do the media impact first. So this is the most, most applied version. Um, I almost really don't need this slide, but obligatory slide to tell you that, that this is an important problem. Um, we're all extremely online these days. So I think we, we realize um, that, that media has a huge impact on the way that we, the media that we see online has a huge impact in the way that we view uh, topics and policies and, and everything, right, offline as well. Um, in particular, I'm highlighting there are studies that we know that um, users are more likely to share a story they see online if it confirms or supports their biases. So that's where this idea with thinking about bounded confidence comes in. And, and of course, like this is an important problem and that sort of sort of, yeah, obligatory slide. So let's, let's dive right into how um, we have thought about this problem. So my goal initially was to think about um, approaching the idea of misinformation and how misinformation spreads from the lens of mechanistic modeling. So there's a lot of amazing work out there that's, that's more in the computational and machine learning side of things. Um, and I'm not so good in that space. Other people are very good in that space. So, so I wanted to come at the mechanistic side and say, is there anything we can learn from simple mechanistic models? Uh, and so here's the idea. This is, this is super simple, but we wanna think about our, whatever our favorite online social media platform is and imagine that the accounts are nodes and that the followerships are networks, or sorry, our networks, are edges in the network. So I have categorized the, the nodes, the accounts into two types of accounts. We say there's non-media and there's media. And the thing that characterizes, so non-media here is blue and those are just nodes that are connected by edges um, to other nodes. And the thing that characterizes the media accounts is that these are accounts who are only followed. They only have in edges in my picture. They don't, they don't follow any other accounts. And so from the perspective of opinion updating, they are not influenced. Their opinions don't change. Um, so they act sort of like those stubborn agents or zealots that I was talking about before. Okay, so if you, um, if you have this setup, something that we are interested in looking at is Suppose that we have perhaps one news cycle and we want to see how a particular story is influencing the non-media nodes. Um, the question that we asked is, 
how does the number of media accounts and the number of followers that each media account has affect where the opinion ends up of these non-media nodes? So that's like the big picture question there from this, from this model. So if I was to actually show you the model, um, well, this should look sort of familiar, right? This is a Hexelman cross style updating, um, which we annotated earlier on. We take opinions on um, the closed interval, negative one to one. So negative one would be, you could think about or construe that as maybe very liberal and, and positive one being the most conservative and then all the nodes fall somewhere in between. Um, so you'll notice that, yeah, the structure is, is quite similar to the Hexelman Krauss style. We've included here also the, the media nodes and they will have, wow, don't want that, no. They, they will have some opinions we might call, the media nodes might have an opinion that you would call say XN. Okay, so what, what this actually looks like in practice is, maybe I could rewrite this for you. This might be like just a regular old, um, being a little bit lazy with my, my arguments here, regular old Hexelman Krauss in the, in the first term and same stuff down here, plus uh, however many media you follow. So let's say, um, doing this on the fly. K is one to however many media there are. And uh, for simplicity and for this, project today, um, we think about all the media as having the same opinion. So this is like multiple posts on the same story or from the same news outlet. So just summing up however many it is that you that you follow. So times the number you follow personally. Okay, so it's sort of like two pieces there. Um, okay, enough enough equations. What does it look like? <laughs> If you, if you like simulate this on the computer. What you have here now is on the horizontal axis, this is time. Vertical axis is the ideology. Now what you want to think about with these types of models, this is Hexelman Krauss synchronous updating. So every node is changing or, or updating at every time step. And so you might think about this as that throughout the course of the simulation, each node is producing content but the ideology of the content that they produce changes. And so that's the thing we're modeling is really the ideology of what our content they produce. And so we're not actually modeling specific messages coming out in, in this type of model. Okay, so here I've showed you an example where there's one media account with one follower, which is essential. that's like a negligible, um, this is negligible in this, in this particular network structure because the non-media network structure is, uh, this is a, Facebook 100 data set, if you've ever seen that. This is, a, this is a Facebook network from like 2005 Reed College. It has uh, 972 nodes. So one media node, this is almost negligible. And you can see what happens is, is unsurprising. If we, if we seed them with opinions uh, uniformly at random on negative one to one, then uh, we actually get um, not consensus, but we get many nodes going to consensus, um, except for some outliers. Maybe they don't have a lot of connections or maybe they are connected to neighbors who are all very different than them. And so you can see all those horizontal lines are those, are those stationary, um, unmovable <laughs> nodes. Um, and so this is, this is pretty standard. If you don't have a lot of media influence, you would just see um, mostly convergence towards zero. That's that averaging at work. But then we wanna look at what happens when we increase the, the media influence. So we add media nodes or we add followers. Um, and that's what I've done here. So the left is the same picture that I just showed you. In the middle, we have 11 same non-media network, but then we add in 11 media nodes and each one has 225 followers. So quite a bit more. And then you see what you might expect to happen, which is that all of the ideologies of the non-media um, eventually sort of they're, they're pulled up to, to the media opinion. So we get vast majority of our nodes at convergence are, are living up 
next to the media opinion, which is like, okay, that makes sense, right? They're, they're not being influenced, but they're constantly influencing, like, of course that's gonna happen. But here's where things get interesting. If, if, it was, if it stopped there, this would be boring and I would not have worked on this problem any further. But, oh yeah, great question. Um, Nicholas asks, how do you choose XM? So what we would do here, um, because this is sort of from a theoretical perspective, XM is something that you would want to vary. In all of, for the talk today, I'm just putting XM at 0.9. Um, and the reason that I'm choosing that one for this talk is that I want something that's quite far from zero so that you can visually see the difference between where it ends up at um, the standard consensus versus, versus where it ends up at the media. But, but in practice, of course, you'd wanna vary that. Or if you were really digging into real data, then you need to think about how to rate different media sources. And that is a very hard problem um, that I think people should work on. Um, yeah, great question. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm just fixing XM at, at, at some arbitrary value. Uh, but then the interesting thing is you would think, okay, so surely just adding more and more media is just gonna make you more and more, like more and more of your accounts. Like eventually maybe you just get, get everyone hanging up there. But that's not true. If at some point, if you continue to saturate by adding more media nodes with that same XM uh, with more followers, then what happens is that you actually see a split. <laughs> so you see a bunch of a bunch of nodes that end up not following at all. They they form their own opinion cluster down. Uh, Got to get out of the eraser down here. So we actually end up with two major opinion clusters, and then still some some of those uh, those holdouts. The key to if you want a clue for why this happens, I'm not going to really show analysis on this today, but look at the time that it takes to converge in these two different cases. Um, so what happens here essentially on the right hand side is that the those nodes that are receptive to the media get pulled so quickly toward the media opinion, right? This is acting sort of like a time scale. It moves so quickly toward the media opinion that they're actually isolating themselves from neighbors that they might otherwise be able to slowly convince, which is what's happening in, a, in my middle picture here. Right, so we see we actually have quite a slower time scale to convergence. Um, so that's the uh, that's the idea, and I thought this was super interesting and uh, and quite surprising when I when I first saw it. So um, looking at the time, not having a lot of time. So what I what do I want to say? Um, essentially, we won't worry about this, but we we have a way that we can quantify. We want to quantify like on average how far the nodes are from the, the media so we could have some summary statistic for media impact. And what we do is if we write down that statistic, then we can make plots that look like this, where we increase on the horizontal axis number of followers that each media account has, on the vertical axis the number of media accounts. Um, so in both directions you're thinking about increasing media um, influence. And then the impact is, is here denoted by our bar, that's the impact, and the darker red is, is the higher higher impact. And so you can see you get this, um, this zone, this little region here, where we actually see the highest values for impact. So that's that like that middle picture that I showed last time. Um, so we thought this is really cool and surprising. And then the remainder of the paper, I won't really go into this for time purposes, but essentially, uh, the ideas that we look at is how robust this is and how this is affected by different network structures and different parameters in the model. Um, so I'm just going to throw at you several, a whole bunch of pictures, and then I'll, I'll refer you to the paper if you're interested. So here's a bunch of different Facebook networks um, where you see the same thing across, right? It's not just this, this read college network is super weird structurally in some way. We see it in um, across the Facebook 100 network. So here's some examples of that same qualitative dynamics. Um, we looked at several synthetic networks. So different synthetic networks have this to different levels, right? We see a, a very intense version of this in the complete network, um, uh, less so if we look at these sort of strange topologies like star, star or ring network topologies, but, um, but we can see this across different network structures as well. 
And then you can see how this um, is affected by different parameters, like the expected number of accounts that you follow, the network size, um, the receptiveness, etc. Um, so I will, I'll, I'll like, maybe that's all I'll say about this project. And here's the little summaries. There's like loads of stuff we could do with this. Um, you can see at the bottom, like at open questions, I gave just a couple of ideas of like things you can think about. Some of these that we will be thinking about and others um, we aren't and, and someone else could pick those up and, and think about. Um, but yeah, lots of things to, to do there. So maybe since I have 10 minutes, I will say like holding, maybe I'll hold the questions. I'll just give you a quick like uh, dive for my other two projects and then we'll have uh, some time to have questions on all of them at the end. So I won't go into the details of the other two, but the big picture idea with my um, dissemination project is that Something that I think sort of annoys people about the way that we did the media impact paper is that you actually aren't modeling particular messages spreading. You're looking at ideologies evolving over time. And the challenge is that that is actually, while it's, while it's interesting, it's really hard if you wanna eventually compare with data because that's not the data. We don't have data typically on people's ideologies evolving or it's, it's quite coarse data like through polling. Um, but what we do have in abundance is Twitter cascades, right? We can actually see how messages are going, um, are going through social media. And so with that in mind, um, I got the idea to study what would happen if you had a bounded confidence mechanism for cascades. So the idea is basically that you would have um, something like this, right? You would have your network and you would start somewhere like on that pink node and then that this node would spread to its neighbors if they're within a confidence bound. So here, C is 0.2, so it would spread to its neighbor there. And then this message might spread to this neighbor, but not to the other because it's too far and so on. And so then we can study the cascades and we could actually maybe start to look at comparing bounded confidence models with data and also look at how these model parameters and network structures would affect the resulting dissemination trees. And so that's basically what the project is. So we did some pretty cool stuff that I'm gonna skip um, where we do some, do some calculations on predicting sizes of these things, predicting when you'll see a large spread. I'll just show you like a picture. Um, so we have like an analytic result for what um, you might call it an infodemic when you're gonna get a large, uh, or when the message is gonna go viral. Maybe that's the way we wanna say it. So the orange is the analytic prediction, which I haven't shown you how we've done, but you'll have to trust me. And then the purple is um, on a network with 10,000 nodes over a thousand trials. And so um, these, are, these are like, the analytic predictions are in the limit as n goes to infinity. Um, so they're actually only, these are only valid at the beginning of, of a, Right, we run into finite size effects eventually, but you can see we do quite well here in the case where we have a large number of messages and then here is, is um, in the case where, where the message doesn't take off and doesn't go viral. So I think for that project, I will maybe just leave that there. This is something that's ongoing. So hopefully in the next couple months, maybe you'll see preprint out about this. And then the last thing, because I promised that I would talk about it is the hypergraphs. Um, so this is some really cool work that I've been doing with, um, with some folks at UCLA. It's led by a fantastic graduate student, Abby, K Abby Hickok. Uh, so she's really the big driver here. And the idea is that um, it's, it's of great interest to try to think about what happens when we allow interactions to go beyond just dyadic pairwise interactions. And, and hypergraphs, I know there's some hypergraph folks on this call today for sure. Um, hypergraphs are, are one possible generalization for polyadic interactions. And the idea is that instead of just having little arrows that represent the edges, each of these colorful circles represents a set of nodes that interact together. So I actually have three hyper edges on the right side um, denoted by the pink, green, and yellow circles respectively. 
And so it could have two nodes, just like the pairwise interactions of networks, but you could have three or four, or in fact, any, right? The edge set is just a subset of power sets of, of your vertices in the hypergraph, as opposed to being subsets of um, just V cross V of the vertex set. Um, so that's a hypergraph, quick and dirty, if you haven't seen it before. And what we've been working on is generalizing specifically the Defont Weisbuck model to hypergraphs. So what we've done is, if you look at the updating I've written down, it's very similar. If you're within some distance, I'll talk a minute about what I mean by that. If we're within some distance, um, we average all of the node opinions on our hyperedge, and otherwise we stay constant. That's very, um, very standard extension, I would say. Um, but the, the new part is that we need to define this discordance function. And the idea is that every node just looks at how far that they are from the mean. And then we sum it up and we divide by essentially something that captures the size of the hyper edge. And so on the example on the right, you could see if you have two nodes like uh, in, the, in the green edge, a node at zero and one, they're quite far. Maybe they are not, um, you could imagine them as like two individuals that are fighting or something. But then if node two with a sort of moderate opinion could come in and be a mediator. And so the discordance in that hyper edge is, in that mediator hyper edge is less. Um, and this could potentially allow for, um, for what well, you could think about it as mediation or maybe peer pressure, which might allow uh, for opinion changes in situations where there would otherwise not be. So that's the idea. Uh, um, we've done, we have some theorems on this. This is another preprint that should hopefully be out in the next couple of months. Um, uh, we can just look at what the, what the theorems we have. We, we can show that like the other bounded confidence models that our hypergraphs model um, converges almost surely for any initial opinion state. We have some characterizations for convergence time, others we don't. Um, again, can talk about that more because I don't wanna go over time. And um, we've looked a little bit at consensus as well. And on a, so on a complete graph, I don't know if this actually says that, but we, we can uh, guarantee consensus on complete graphs in a few cases. We can guarantee it if the opinions are bounded. And we can guarantee it if the variance of the initial opinions is less than the confidence bound. We haven't, we haven't proven, but we conjecture that this actually is also true um, for larger variant, larger but finite variance um, initial opinions as well. So we do have some consensus results, uh, but again, not yet a complete characterization. And the coolest thing um, in this hypergraph model is that you could see, especially on the right, you, I guess if you do a hypergraph talk, you have to like show some simulations from the Enron email hypergraph. I think that's a law. Um, so we've done that. We've, we did some simulations on this Enron hypergraph, um, which is a real, a real hypergraph. And the strange thing that happens is that you can get what we call opinion jumps, which is where an opinion moves more than, um, than the confidence bound. So, you could see like these big places where there's these huge like vertical lines. Um, and we can show that this actually only happens if you have hyper edges of size greater than two. So this can only, this can only happen to hypergraphs. This can't ha happen in a standard model. So uh, that's part of the reason that we, we conjecture that consensus is actually easier in the hypergraph version of the models because we have this possibility for opinion jumps um, or you know, peer pressure, if you like. So this is sort of a cool result. Um, and again, this is, this is something that's still ongoing. We're hoping to get out in the next few months. So be on the lookout for that. Um, but it's 11.59, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna say thank you. And while I'll hang out and take questions and chat a little bit, and then what I'll do is I'll leave up this slide. So get in touch with me um, via email. You can find my, me on my website. Um, I'm on Twitter, I'm kind of like inconsistent on Twitter, but I, I'm on there, so you can find me. Um, and then you can, you know, screenshot this slide or whatever if there's any of the references that you wanted to, wanted to read. So thanks so much for coming today. You're all heroes for coming to a Zoom talk in the middle of the day, truly. That's, um, 
that's that's very strong. I, I respect that. So thank you so much for being here. I'll do the clap for for the rest of the crowd. Um, so Thank yeah, so, so so we've got the full hour now, but we can uh, hang around a bit longer. Um, people can ask questions. Uh, there is stuff popping up in the chat. I haven't seen whether it's just people uh, celebrating you or, or asking questions. So let's check that out. Looks like someone said Enron email hypergraph award. I do feel that that. Is that a real thing? If it's not, it's it should be, huh? <laughs> it should be. Um, so Nick has raised his hand. Nick, do you want to ask a question? Uh, thanks for a great talk. And uh, I had a question about the uh, hypergraph stuff. So uh, it kind of seems in some ways, I was just thinking about this, it almost seems like it could anchor your opinion potentially in the way that the media does. I, I haven't really thought through that, but I was kind of curious if you could end up with like an emperor has no clothes situation, uh, or could you model something like that where in a group you express a different opinion than you do with your close friends? Mm. Oh, that's super interesting. Um, so we, haven't done that in this model. The so the opinion that a node has is the same. In you know so um, first of all, the thing that Nicholas is pointing out, in case y'all didn't realize this, is that um, of course a node could be in in multiple hyper edges, right? So it may be in some some edges of size two, and it may also be in some edges of size four, and it may be in some of size one hundred. So it might be in like multiple different groups at the same time. In our model. It has the same, it expresses the same opinion everywhere. But I think it would be super interesting to think about um, perhaps relaxing that. And um, yeah, I, I love it. I haven't thought about it, uh, but, but it's, that's cool. So I, I would have a question about the computational implications of the stuff that you do. So for example, uh, I think a lot of people who are not that familiar with the theory, we want to run something like an agent-based model or something, and then um, we just have to come up with ways of how we run the simulation. And there's things of making decisions as to whether we do synchronous updating and a simulation or asynchronous updating. Uh, and so uh, I think in the very clear introduction that you gave in the beginning, you made a great point of why these, like what seems like a small decision to make when you're coding it up can actually have big implications of what you can see in your simulation. Mm -hmm. so you kind of can offer some advice for people who are more on the computational side of what are kind of the pits, pitfalls or how to go about that. Oh, that's such, that's such a good question. I don't know if I have adv like good advice. I would have to think about it. Um, but I would say that I guess the advice I will offer now is to just be really careful and intentional about your choices for agent-based models. Um, in particular, I think the one that is highlighted here is that um, you might think, or I don't know, I would think naively perhaps that uh, updating one agent at a time or one edge at a time is like basically the same as updating everybody at a time. And so maybe you might just think I, I can be expeditious and just do like groups of them at a time. But you should be super careful because actually the 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 outcomes in, in models like this are not guaranteed to be the same. And so yeah, other than this is not advice, <laughs> but just like a, a cautionary tale that um, just to be like explicit about explicit and intentional about your choices when you're doing agent-based modeling. Um, so it's a, it's an awesome point. I don't know if there's like great insights that I have right now about like here's how to make it faster and and good um, based on <laughs> that that I, I I don't think I have good advice for. It, but yeah, I would say to be careful. Um, these these types of models can surprise you and the little the choices matter. That's pretty much true in like most network models, I think. Choices matter and you gotta 
um, be careful about that. So I think um, another thank you from Nick. Uh, a thanks from me too, Heather. This was great. Um, uh, I've, I've had the names of the, the founded confidence models and I've seen them in, in Mason seminar over and over again, but this was a very much needed and awesome introduction to them. Uh, Fantastic. And I'm, I'm looking like I'm, I'm rooting for, for your ongoing work and I'm, I'm excited to see where that takes you. Uh, and Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming today. Thanks so much for having me. This was great fun. Um, and I appreciate all of your like engagement and interaction, like feeling that humanity on the other side of the screen is always nice. So thanks all. I'll do one more clap. And then um, I think I'm going to end the call and I hope to, I'll send an email out about the talk next week and hope to see all of you again soon. Bye. Thanks.